I am going to finish up with cardiodynamics and um, blood pressure regulation. I'm hoping that will take about a half to two-thirds of the class. Um, and then the end of it, uh, I'm going to kind of throttle back a little bit for you guys. And we're going to look at different ways of imaging the heart. Um, I have some uh, cool slides that you'll be able to uh, perhaps appreciate the uh, current state of technology uh, with. And then, uh, time permitting, I'm going to talk about heart disease. I probably have more slides than I can talk about today, but I promise I won't rush. And if I don't talk about something, it's not a big deal because I'm not probably intending to quiz you very hard on all the stuff at the end of the lecture. So it's just going to, it's there for uh, interest for you because it's a fascinating field. Um, cardiac imaging and then heart disease, the epidemic that our country faces. So, but first, the hard stuff. I put the hard stuff first for you guys because that was one of the comments that you'd rather have the intense stuff at the beginning of the lecture when I can take my time. So we'll do that. There's a quiz on Monday um, over uh, the material that we've had thus far. All right. So <clears throat> we were talking about ways of affecting the cardiac output. Now give me a definition of cardiac output again. What, what did I say? Somebody. What is the cardiac output? Try to push yourself and look and tell me without looking at your notes. Just listen to that. Yeah, Matt, what does the word mean to you? Cardiac output. Uh, it's the difference between, oh no, cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. Okay, and so what is the upshot of that? Uh, what is that going to tell us about, about the heart? Um, the, the volume of blood it pumps per amount of time. Minute. Thank you. Perfect. Yep. It's just how much, uh, it's really, if you want to think of it in terms of um, like an analogy to electricity, it's like the current. It's how much blood is actually being uh, pumped per minute um, out of the heart. Right? And so the ways we affect uh, cardiac output are by either increasing the heart rate, how fast the heart is pumping, or the stroke volume, how much blood is getting pumped per beat, okay? So, uh, and this slide is primarily focused on uh, stroke volume. Here's sort of an overview of uh, the different things that can uh, affect cardiac output, and we're focusing on this, this side, the stroke volume. So, um, there are a... A few definitions that I started talking about. There's filling time. Uh, this is uh, how long we allow uh, the ventricles to fill with blood. All right. So it's that duration of that time that they are in diastole, uh, the time when the ventricle is not contracting. A venous return um, is how much, it, it's the speed with which blood is, or the rate with which blood is returning to the heart uh, during ventricular diastole. Um, so this is how much blood is coming back through the low pressure portion of the circulatory system, through the, through the veins. Um, and then these notions of preload and afterload. So uh, the preload is how much pressure of blood is in uh, the, the ventricle uh, before, it begins its, um, before it begins its contraction. So at the end of uh, diastole, what is the pressure of blood uh, that has been pushed into that ventricle, all right? And, so, and that's going to be uh, affected by a, a number of factors, um, and we'll, we're going to go through those here, both the venous return and the filling time are going to um, affect the preload. And then finally, the afterload. This is the pressure against which uh, the heart has to work to eject blood. And essentially, that afterload is uh, this value right here. So what is, what is this pressure that uh, the ventricle has to work against uh, to be able to open up those aortic valves, right? So the lower this is uh, then the, the more 
uh, blood is going to be able to be ejected. All right. So <clears throat> uh, the, if you have increased uh, venous return, if you're, you're bringing uh, blood, more blood back into uh, the heart, you're increasing preload, and thus you're increasing uh, the end diastolic volume. You just have more blood in the heart to begin with before you contract. So there's going to be more blood in there to potentially eject. Um, and then, of course, uh, the converse is true. So venous return and end diastolic volume are uh, directly correlated. That's a, that's a direct correlation. The same with filling time. This should also make sense to you. Uh, so the longer you allow that ventricle to fill, then the greater the preload is going to be. If you cause that heart to, if, if the heart contracts before it's been able to fill to its maximal capacity, then you're going to have less blood in the heart to be able to eject. So uh, both the venous return and uh, the, the filling time are going to affect end diastolic volume which is uh, directly correlated with stroke volume. So the higher the um, end diastolic volume, the higher the stroke volume. Does that make sense? Yeah. You should, like, all of this should be common sense if you just, just think about the heart like a pump, okay, which is what it is. Um, and then <clears throat> a preload does affect end systolic volume uh, secondarily. Um, so if, uh, and, and that, that is, a, is a complicated relationship that I don't want to go through, actually. Um, and so and as difficult as this looks, as complicated as this looks, this is actually kind of a simplification uh, in, in some ways. There, cardiodynamics is, is quite sophisticated, and if you go on to medical school or something, you'll, you'll learn about it more in your rotation. So <clears throat> on the other side, uh, there is the ability to affect end systolic volume. So end systolic volume is a measure of how much blood, um, it, it, stroke volume is the measure of how much blood was ejected, but it is a measure of how much blood is left after contraction. So how much of the blood was, were you able to push out of the heart uh, and leaving the end systolic volume, uh, the remaining blood. So this is clearly going to be uh, affected by the contractility of the muscle, all right? So if there is a high contractility in the muscle, uh, then you're going to have a low end systolic volume, meaning if, that, if those heart muscle cells were able to contract fully and have, and have significant contraction, uh, then you're going to have ejected more blood. There's going to be a larger change in volume in the heart. So high contractility leads to a low end systolic volume, uh, and low end systolic volume is in, uh, correlated with a high stroke volume. All right, so this is the other side of the coin from the end diastolic volume. Um, so this contractility is uh, is a, a direct function of uh, sarcomere. O length, like the, the overlap of the sarcomeres in, in the cardiac muscle. Um, but it can be affected by these other uh, factors up here. So we have increased sympathetic stimulation. So if you're going to increase uh, the uh, sympathetic autonomic input via the sympathetic nerves uh, from the medulla, we, we went over that the cardioacceleratory nucleus in the medulla uh, comes down, synapses, uh, goes through the white rami, communicante, synapses in the sympathetic ganglion, and then uh, emerges uh, via a, a sympathetic um, a nerve to uh, synapse on the heart. That is going to increase contractility. So this is uh, directly uh, correlated. On the other hand, parasympathetic uh, stimulation is going to decre decrease contractility, and that's being uh, propagated via the uh, vagus nerve. So that's the vasovagal response. Um, and then there, so this is the uh, nervous system control, and then on this hand there is hormonal control. Um, if we have uh, an increase in epinephrine, norepinephrine, glucagon, uh, 
the thyroid hormones, that is also going to increase uh, contractility of uh, the uh, myocardiocytes in the myocardium. So <clears throat> that's the contractility. Afterload is also going to have an effect on the end systolic volume. Okay, so <coughs> if you have, uh, you can think of afterload as a, a proxy for uh, your your arterial blood pressure, right? Uh, so this is the blood pressure that your heart is working against. If you have higher blood pressure, uh, your heart is going to be able to eject less uh, eject less blood. So the increased afterload is directly correlated with an increased end systolic volume, meaning we've ejected less blood. Less blood has been shoved out of the heart because those valves have closed earlier um, in, in, uh, in uh, response to the contraction of the heart. Uh, and, and then, of course, the opposite is true. So a reduced afterload, if you have a lower blood pressure, then you're going to have a lower end systolic volume because the heart will have been able to eject more um, blood. So what, how, do we, uh, how do we affect that? So we can either increase... Oh, hello. Is this on a timer or something? What did, what did that... That was weird. Um... Uh, how do we affect afterload? We can either increase vasoconstriction. So this means that we are going to reduce the volume that the blood occupies. All right. So we, we vasoconstrict uh, the arteries, arterioles, capillaries, etc. Uh, so we reduce that volume. And when we do that, we're going to increase the arterial blood pressure. Um, and uh, that will increase afterload and reduce, uh, increase end stroke uh, systolic volume and thus decrease stroke volume and thus cardiac output. And uh, conversely, if you have a vasodilation, so uh, an, an, an expansion of the diameter of the arterioles uh, and the uh, capillaries, et cetera, then you will... Um, reduce the afterload and reduce end stroke uh, end systolic volume uh, thus increasing the amount of blood per stroke or stroke volume that you're able to eject does that make sense I walked through that uh, pretty thoroughly there so that you would understand uh, what's going on all right um, so let's think about the circulatory system here for just a moment um, and the distribution of blood. Uh, when we look at uh, the vessel diameter, so here we have, here's the heart. Uh, it goes into these uh, arteries and then uh, smaller blood vessels finally into capillaries and then returns up a similar tree of veins. Those first arteries, for example, the, the uh, aorta, this is... Um, the largest diameter, of course, and people think of the aorta as being muscly. The aorta is actually not the most muscly of the, the arteries. It is the smaller arteries like the subclavian or the brachial artery or the iliac and femoral arteries. Those have more muscle to them. The aorta is more elastic, actually. It has less myocardium. It's able to expand uh, as the blood goes into it. And then it's almost like a capacitor for those of you. I guess I've been teaching circuitry in high school, and I'm thinking about things in terms of electricity right now. But um, it, it absorbs some of that volume of blood, some of the pressure wave, uh, and then it releases that over time. So it sort of smooths the spike of your blood pressure uh, out um, because of uh, the elastic property in the, in the aorta. Um, there's a lot of interesting things about the aorta as well, that, that iliac bifurcation um, has uh, plays into the functioning of the heart in terms of the soliton wave that that um, backs off of that that comes backwards off of that bifurcation. But uh, we'll leave that for another time. Uh, so, anyways, starting at the aorta, it has obviously the largest diameter. All right, and we move through uh, to arterioles, down to capillaries. Here, this is uh, where we have exchange with the tissue, and we move our way back up. Uh, into the vena cava, 
for example. And however, even though these are the largest diameter, uh, they have the smallest cross-sectional area uh, as, as a whole, right? So your, your aorta is only this much cross-sectional area, uh, whereas the cross-sectional area of all of the capillaries combined is far greater than that of the aorta, all right? Because of that, the pressure is highest in the aorta. And the pressure is lower here because this cross-sectional area <coughs> is, is higher in aggregate. There's a lot of capillaries. They're really small, but there's a lot of them. And so uh, you have a lot of aggregate cross-sectional area, and thus the blood pressure is dropping as we get here. And then blood pressure is quite low on the venous side, on the venous return side. Um, and uh, the blood, because uh, we are... Um, reducing vessel diameter as we go down uh, the velocity of the blood that's going through. Um, oh no, I'm sorry, as, that, I had that backwards. As we're increasing the aggregate cross-sectional area, uh, the velocity of blood goes down as we uh, pass through the capillary beds. And then this cross-sectional area drops again, and we do have a small increase in uh, the velocity of, of blood back on the venous side. All right, so this is kind of a, a recap of that slide that I showed last time. Um, I updated it. I don't know if I put this updated thing with all the color coding in it in the slide, in, in the thing I might have. Just, did anybody look uh, in the last two, three A's at the slides? Anyways, um, so what I did was I replaced all the gray arrows that they had with... Uh, the orange and the green. So if it's green, it's a direct correlation, and if it's uh, orange, it's an inverse uh, correlation to help you understand that. And so I hear like autonomic innervation, uh, sympathetic innervation is directly correlated with uh, contractility. So increased sympathetic leads to increased contractility. Uh, uh, <coughs> increased parasympathetic leads to decreased contractility. So that's an inverse correlation, you follow that. <coughs> increased filling time leads to in, increased preload, which leads to end, uh, increased end diastolic volume, which leads to increased stroke volume, which leads to increased uh, cardiac output, for example. So that's all this color, color coding means. And I, I have essentially gone through all of that just a few minutes ago. So this entire side was the stroke volume side in that slide. And then this adds uh, the heart rate side. So, um, Obviously, autonomic innervation uh, is going to affect the heart rate. Uh, the sympathetic is the cardioacceleratory uh, um, increase on the heart rate, and uh, the uh, parasympathetic uh, innervation via the vagus nerve is going to decrease the heart rate. This is, on the sympathetic side, this is uh, stimulated by the atrial reflex. Uh, there are barrow receptors that, so pressure receptors that are embedded in the wall of the heart uh, in the atrium, the right atrium near the SA node, and uh, they are stimulated by uh, blood returning, the, the, the venous blood uh, pressure returning from the vena cava. So venous return is what stimulates this atrial uh, reflex and leads to uh, sympathetic uh, input into um, the, yeah, autonomic um, stimulation of heart rate. So filling time doesn't have anything to do with heart rate. It's just like the speed that blood comes in. So, <clears throat> yeah, f I mean, filling time is directly a consequence of the heart rate, okay. right? It's a direct consequence of, of the heart rate. Um, so, I mean, you know, there's only so many arrows you can put on this thing, but this... It, you know, this is a direct consequence of what your of your heart rate, and it, okay. it, it I mean, they're they're interleaved. We're trying to comb out uh, different ways of thinking about this thing that are uh, that are sort of more uh, integrated with one another. Um, okay, so uh, blood pressure. So <clears throat> um, the the next I don't know five slides here are Andrea Tilden's slides, and I, this is the first time I've actually. Uh, used any of her material in this class. Normally I don't talk about blood pressure, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit for you guys. So, um, 
hypotension is uh, a low blood pressure. So when you look at a blood pressure, you see uh, the systolic number, which is on top, that's in millimeters of mercury, and the bottom number uh, is the diastolic number. So hypotension is anything where the top number is lower than 90, that's pretty low, and lower than 50. This is a little bit lower than normal um, blood pressure. And uh, it can lead to lightheadedness, dizziness, loss of consciousness, um, etc. So, uh, for example, if you are a person who is prone to being a little lightheaded or dizzy once in a while, maybe you stand up uh, rapidly and you, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe you are, um, you just have naturally low blood pressure and you're, you're close to this. Um, on the other side, there's hypertension, which is a much more serious problem. I'm not, I'm not diminishing um, the, the risks of, of chronic uh, extreme hypotension, but hypertension, uh, it's, it, it does more wear and tear on your cardiovascular system, on your body, in fact. Uh, and it can lead to uh, coronary artery disease, stroke, uh, heart attacks, heart failure, uh, et cetera. So what does hypertension mean? Um, here's a normal person. If you, uh, if your systolic is 120 or less, and diastolic is less than 80, um, that I, I'm assuming, unless there's anybody who has some uh, physiology that's outside the normal range in here, uh, for a person your age, that most of you will fall into that range. Um, typically, I don't know if Scott Guy is having you do it. I, I tried to get him to do. I do this mean arterial pressure and, and BMI, uh, body mass index experiment with my when I run the lab and I have I've had students for like 10 years now uh, record their mean arterial pressure which is just a kind of like an average it's a weighted average of the systolic and diastolic uh, pressure and then um, and then your BMI which is uh, it, it, it's <coughs> kind of related to your your uh, your height and weight. It's an index that, that takes into account height and weight. Um, yeah. I thought that BMI was kind of medically not. Yeah, really it's not ideal because look at, uh, yeah, I don't want to discuss the merits of BMI, but the point is uh, looking at the, the correlation between obesity and mean arterial pressure, BMI is a good one to use actually because there is a lot of scatter in the data and for that project it's nice to have scatter so that the students can explain the scatter and, and by way of explaining what's wrong with BMI. Anyways, um, but uh, sometimes I, I find students that are hypertensive. There are, there are students out there. So pre-hypertensive is if your top number's over 120, just a little bit, maybe 20 points, maybe 10 points over on the diastolic. And then you get into real hypertension here, stage one. Uh, this is, you know, from 140 to 60 and, and just below 100. And then if you are really genuinely uh, hypertensive, then it's 160 or up or 100 or up. In fact, it's the diastolic number that is, is more dangerous because your heart spends more time in diastole, right? You, your, your heart is in diastole, um, so about two thirds of the time. So having a really high diastolic number can, uh, can be problematic. Yes? I was gonna ask which of the two is more important. Yep, diastolic. Um, how do we regulate the blood pressure? <clears throat> so uh, three ways, uh, via the nervous system, uh, via hormones, and then there is local control, uh, auto-regulation, uh, and the auto-regulation is very tissue-specific. I'm not going to talk about uh, these two methods very much. I'm, um, I'm going to save this for the endocrine chapter um, and the kidney chapter uh, when I talk about the renal function because the, the uh, kidney is deeply involved in, in regulating blood pressure uh, hormonally. But I'm going to spend the, uh, the rest of the time on this topic uh, talking about the way the nervous system controls it. Uh, the central nervous system, there's two regions of the brain uh, that do this. Uh, there's the hypothalamus and the medulla. Uh, the hypothalamus is the uh, part of the diencephalon, uh, so just at the very top of the brain stem, uh, the hypothalamus is this sort of pyramidal region that, uh, I should have put a picture in, it says a thousand words, I guess, and that descends from the, the thalamus and has the hypophysis 
um, below it. And this is what is responsible for uh, starting the cascade of hormonal release that uh, is tied up into here. So the hypothalamus is going to be responsible for, uh, for getting ADH and vasopressin uh, cascades moving all right, via the uh, hypothesis. And we'll talk about that later. But however, uh, the medulla is uh, the part of the brain that is uh, responsible for direct uh, nervous control um, of, of the blood pressure. And we'll see how that happens in a moment. Um, and then the, the peripheral nervous system uh, has sensory input from the various baroreceptors. Uh, these can be in the carotid bulb at the carotid bifurcation. Uh, it's in the aortic bodies in the aortic arch. Uh, there are um, the baroreceptors that I talked about just a moment ago in the, involved in the atrial reflex near the SA node. There, there are baroreceptors throughout the, blood, uh, the body. Um, and then uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, uh, nerves of the PNS via the vagus and the sympathetic uh, nerves. So those are the, the components of nervous control. Let's look at it a little bit. Oh, here's the picture. Yeah, right. So here's the hypothalamus that I talked about, and it, it feeds into the hypophysis or pituitary gland down here. This is all hormonal control. The medulla, on the other hand, is part of the brain stem here, um, and uh, it <clears throat> is going to have output, uh, parasympathetic output, and we've seen this maybe like eight slides ago in last lecture where I showed the cutaway of the medulla and the two regions in that automatic innervation slide, if you'll cast your mind back. Uh, so there's the, the parasympathetic uh, nucleus that the, that the vagus uh, emanates from. This is going to decrease the heart rate. The cardioaccelerator and the vasomotor uh, regions of the medulla, this is going to increase the heart rate uh, and contractility. So this uh, heart rate is going to affect um, the speed at which the heart is beating, of course, and then the contractility is going to affect the stroke volume. So how much is that heart contracting per beat? And then the vasomotor nerves, the sympathetic vasomotor nerves, are going to lead to vasoconstriction, all right, and thus would increase the, uh, the afterload that the heart is working against. Um, all right. So moving into the PNS, um, we have the motor output uh, via the vagus. There is afferent coming through the vagus and along the gl uh, glossopharyngeal nerve, uh, which is also one of the uh, cranial nerves, uh, all, all uh, being processed right in the medulla uh, at the cardioregulatory uh, and vasomotor centers there. And then they have, uh, they have efferents that come out, uh, descend the, the uh, so this is parasympathetic, and then on the sympathetic side, we have uh, them descending the spinal cord and emanating uh, via the, the white rami communicantes to the sympathetic chain ganglia, which then are going to synapse and send uh, send nerves to via sympathetic nerves to the heart uh, and to the various uh, blood uh, vessels. So what? else do I need to say about this? Oh yeah, on the motor output, for the parasympathetic uh, output, uh, we're, we're talking about muscarinic uh, acetylcholine receptors. So these M2 muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. And on the sympathetic side, uh, there are three types of, of receptors that are important uh, in this uh, discussion uh, that find themselves either on heart or blood vessels. The, either alpha-1, beta-1, or beta-2 uh, receptors. And we'll see what that means in a moment, okay? All right, first the alpha-1 receptors. So um, alpha-1 receptors uh, are respond they, they synapse on smooth muscle. They're responsible for vasoconstriction uh, in various blood vessels. Uh, you find them in the kidney. 
uh, in the skin, in the brain, the digestive system, and uh, also in skeletal, uh, skeletal muscle blood vessels servicing uh, the skeletal muscle, as well as uh, pilo erection. This means uh, goosebumps, basically, your, your hair standing on end, uh, ejaculation, and pupil dilation. All of these, um, all of these functions are mediated by alpha-1 receptors. Alpha-1 receptor... Uh, its, its agonist is uh, either epinephrine or norepinephrine, although it prefers norepinephrine than uh, to epinephrine. And uh, this is a, is a phospholipase C uh, signaling cascade. So we have the receptor as a G protein coupled receptor, which then is going to activate phospholipase C. Phospholipase C uh, is, is, a, is an enzyme that's going to cleave um, uh, phosphatidyl inositol diphosphate uh, into diacylglyceride and inositol triphosphate. Um, so what all that means, for those of you who haven't had biochemistry uh, yet, is uh, inositol is a, it, it looks a little bit like glucose, except it uh, does not have the acetal. So one of the members of the ring in glucose is going to be an oxygen. In inositol, it's not. It's just a, it's a cyclohexane ring, all right? But it has uh, six hydroxyl groups around it. And uh, two of them are uh, the phosphates. And you're not going to need to be able to reproduce all this, but... drawing it for you. Um, so there's one of these. It's got the two phosphates. Then there's another uh, phosphate, uh, which is then attached uh, to a diacylglyceride. So we have a glyceride uh, molecule uh, here. It's a three-carbon chain, and one is here, two is here, and three is here. There are ester bonds that form these long acyl chains. These HCl chains embed themselves in the membrane. So this is, uh, this is a phospholipid. It's called a phospholipid uh, that's embedded in the chain. And ph um, phospholipase C cleaves this bond right here. Uh, and this cyclizes, and then uh, that it, it gets... Uh, cleaved, that cyclization gets uh, opened up uh, to the inositol triphosphate, which is essentially uh, this baby right here. And that initiates a signaling cascade uh, that involves calcium that starts uh, the smooth muscle contraction. Okay? So it is a phospholipase C uh, system. The other two uh, are beta receptors, beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. And we find the beta receptors uh, in the heart. Um, so um, they are uh, on the SA node cells, and they're uh, chronotropic. This means a chronotrope is something that's going to increase the heart rate. Um, and they can also uh, synapse, find these synapses on cardiac muscle cells and they're going to increase the strength of contraction. Uh, we call these enotropes. So an enotrope is something that's going to increase the contractility of uh, a muscle cell, and a chronotrope is going to increase uh, the rate of depolarization of, of that cell. So again, uh, they are stimulated by epinephrine and norepinephrine. However, uh, this is an adenylate cyclase rather than a phospholipase C pathway. So this is taking ATP and making cyclic AMP out of it. Cyclic AMP uh, then becomes the signal, the second messenger, which starts the downstream cascade uh, in heart muscle contraction, smooth muscle. Uh, it also affects uh, glycogenolysis, so liberation of, of ox uh, I'm sorry, glycogen reserves uh, for uh, contraction. The beta-2 receptors are found on smooth muscle, 
and um, they <clears throat> lead to dilation or actually relaxation of uh, the smooth muscle. So, uh, for example, this is uh, this would be the smooth muscle of your bronchioles. Um, if you're going to activate these beta uh, two receptors then, uh, for example, you would be able to breathe deeper. It would allow more uh, airflow uh, through the bron bronchioles. It also, uh, it, they're found in the <coughs> digestive tract, the liver, and here, uh, salient to this uh, conversation, is uh, in blood vessels. So it's these beta-2 receptors that give us uh, vasodilation. Um, uh, oh, yeah. There are more beta-2 in skeletal muscle, but there is some uh, alpha-1. I, I think I had mentioned that. So there is that. that that's uh, all I had to say about uh, blood pressure and cardiodynamics. I was going to now talk about some of the more fun stuff, I guess, for about 15 minutes. Uh, were there any questions about any of that? All right. So this is what uh, a cardiac cath lab, a cardiac, uh, cardiac catheter lab, uh, looks like um, in Maine General. This is the one in Maine General. I don't know if they're going to be able to bring you in there, but they, they may. That may be a sterile field. Uh, they may not allow the public in there, but, um, but maybe not. Because uh, not, it's not actually open heart surgery happening in there. Uh, so you might get to go and see this place, that actual room. Um, so what they do here in uh, cardiac catheterization is they uh, go into your uh, common iliac artery here in your, in your inguinal region, and they lead a guide wire um, up through uh, the iliac, up the aorta, and down, um, and so that you can, they can... Um, for uh, angiography, cardiac uh, angiography, what they're going to do is release some, some dye into uh, the uh, coronary vessels. So uh, you may remember, maybe not, maybe I didn't talk about cardiac circulation enough, but uh, here is your aorta. Here's the aortic semilunar valve, right, coming out of the left ventricle. Uh, and then we have, you know, the brachiocephalic trunk, the, the left uh, common carotid and subclavian coming off here, and then we go down all the way into the abdomen. But right here, first dibs is the heart, and off the heart comes the right and left uh, coronary vessels, all right? So the first blood that comes out of the aorta is going to go into these coronary vessels. What they do is they run this guide wire up here, and they're going to shoot some contrasting dye into uh, that vessel. And we're going to see, uh, we're going to be able to visualize the uh, heart. So let's see here. For example, here's a coronary uh, angiogram where uh, here's, here's the guide wire, here's the right coronary artery, and a, and a healthy, happy person. Uh, and then here is the coronary vessel and somebody that's obstructed. So this person has um, uh, some sclerosis there. They, they have uh, like a, a, you know, a plaque, an arterial plaque that has uh, filled their uh, coronary artery. Part of the reason this happens uh, so often to the, in, this part, in this part of your vascular tree is the most intense blood is coming out right here. It's right at the doorway, right? So there's a lot of turbulent flow that's coming down here. That blood has been, um, it can be, turbulent flow can activate inflammatory processes in the blood. So if your blood lipids are out of whack, um, the most likely place for you to have uh, deposition of LDL, foam cells, and all, and all that that leads to these plaques is in the coronary arteries. It's a design flaw. Uh, but humans weren't meant to live to be 70, 80, 90. By the time you guys get old, you'll be 110 probably. Who knows? So, um, all right. Another uh, visualization method is echocardiogram. And what's nice about this 
is you don't have to like stick wires up into your heart and run wires all the way through you, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't require a sterile environment. They just basically, it's like ultrasound, basically. It's like you do with a baby. It's ultrasound, but you just do it on the chest. And so this is a basic uh, stress test. You have this person run here, and then, you know, he's happily on the treadmill, and you, got, you put the echocardiogram on, and you can visualize the heart directly uh, using ultrasound. So let's see what that looks like. Here is um, here are some baseline uh, stress echoes. You have a heart. Now this is an interesting case, however, because uh, this this person had um, so this is the the ventricle, and here's the the left atrium and, and the and the left ventricle. This person had had. Uh, external cancer and had had uh, radiation treatment uh, when he was a kid and developed this weird uh, growth on the cusp of his mitral valve uh, that they picked up in this echocardiogram that he had to, he has to go through every year. Um, and so we can see it here, this like <laughs> this is not what it's supposed to look like. You can see here these uh, this Doppler uh, radar, it's like, it's, it's kind of like Doppler radar. Uh, this is showing uh, speed of blood flow, um, and you, you can see that it's, it's causing uh, some turbulence in, uh, in the tissue there. Here it's really dramatic. This thing is like flopping in and out between the atrium and uh, the ventricle. So we'll see some more pictures of this guy as we go here. This is a uh, cardiac MRI scanner. Magnetic resonance imaging. Um, I actually st studied uh, nuclear magnetic resonance in my PhD. Uh, pretty, pretty cool technique. This is uh, a technique that is, here we go, start. This is a pretty uh, high, large file, so maybe it's not going to, oh, it's working. So this is the same guy's heart, and we can see the shadow here is flopping in and out through that valve. Um, in this MRI scanner. And what we're looking at here are, ba this is uh, a T1 weighted image, I think, yeah. um, where you're looking at the response from protons, uh, the differential response from uh, water protons versus, uh, versus protons that are alkyl, like attached to a, a carbon. So um, here's another picture. You can really dramatically see that uh, growth, that tumor on this guy's valve. Um, liver here, this is going to be the hepatic artery. Uh, yeah. This would be uh, the, the atrium on the other side of the heart. This is the wall of the heart, that interventricular septum. Um, so uh, fMRI, functional MRI, can also give you information about the speed of blood flow. So uh, this is actually an old, an older image. You could uh, certainly get a video of this uh, nowadays. But here is the speed of of a fluid flow uh, through the heart. And then here is a person with uh, severe arterial disease of the heart. Um, so uh, the next is. Uh, computed tomography, a CT scan, uh, can also be done uh, on the heart. And you can get the, these, reconstruct these really beautiful, uh, I'm sorry that's a low res image, but uh, you can get really nice uh, 3D voxelated images of the heart using a CT scanner. Um, so here is CT of this guy uh, without any contrast, and then some sort of uh, contrasted image where uh, you can see that growth in this guy's uh, heart. There it is after it's been resected. That was what was flopping around in those videos. Pretty interesting and gross. Um, so <clears throat> if you want a different view with an echocardiogram, you can also do this transesophageal trans echo. So you basically just run the tube down the person's throat and shine uh, the ultrasound forward and you can get an entirely different view of the heart uh, from this method. So here is some transesophageal uh, echo in uh, a person who has mitral valve stenosis. 
this mitral valve should be opening nice and big, but we're getting uh, really um, minimal motion in that, uh, in that valve. Here is a different view of the transesophageal uh, echocardiogram. Here we can see the leaves of the stenotic uh, valve. It has all kinds of calcification on it here. It should be, it should be all much more clean and open uh, than it is. And so then they can do um, some, some 3D space-filling reconstructions from enough uh, viewpoints where you see this valve here uh, has all this calcification on it, and very stenotic, not allowing enough blood from the left atrium into the uh, left ventricle. All right. So that was the imaging, the, the breeze through. I do want to get five minutes to talk about heart disease. I probably won't get all the way through it, but I'll say a little bit. Mostly I just want to get to the economics of it, because that's what's interesting to me. Um, as I had mentioned, right, so we have the right and left coronary arteries, which then arborize to, fe uh, to feed the myocardium of the heart. Uh, but if we get uh, a, a stenosis, a plaque deposition in the wall, it's these fat cells, uh, these foam cells that, uh, that adhere, these LDL, uh, uh, low-density lipoprotein uh, cells cause inflammation and, and then adhere to the wall and with time occlude the passageway uh, for the blood. And what happens is we have ischemia or, uh, or uh, lack of oxygen in that tissue, which leads to an infarct or uh, tissue death um, in, the, in the wall of the heart. All right, so here is a coronary angiogram. This is the one with the, in the coronary cath lab I showed you in the beginning. You run a guide wire, which would be right here. Here's the guide wire uh, right there. And then we inject uh, the, the, the contrasting dye, which is going to show up on an x-ray into the body of the heart. We can see the wall of the heart here, and it's being uh, served by this uh, coronary artery. Here, in, on the other hand, is somebody, oh, no, 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 this is, this, this is a healthy heart as well. Okay. But this is what it looks like uh, in real-time imaging now. Um, so, uh, heart disease can lead to a uh, sign of heart disease is this angina pectoris. Uh, this is uh, this temporary ischemia that leads to heart uh, to, to pain that radiates in these characteristic regions, typically down the right arm. So, any of these regions here can be indicative of uh, ischemia. Why do you get heart disease? Well. Number one, you smoke. I hope no one in here smokes. Uh, you have high blood pressure. You have uh, dyslipidemia. Your lipids are out of whack somehow. You lead a high-stress lifestyle despite uh, my, my, my urgings, or maybe you just haven't taken my class. Uh, you lead a sedentary lifestyle. You sit on your keister. That's probably the one that you guys are the most uh, prone to going forward in your life. Hopefully you take your active lifestyle with you from Colby. All right, this is the slide I want to get to. Uh, the rest of it's line yap. So uh, there's a massive toll. Some of these numbers are a few years old now, quite a few years old. Um, but 25% um, of patients uh, with myocardial infarction uh, die before they even can get help, all right? So they're not getting enough. There's not enough preventative medicine. We're not uh, screening enough people. 65% of them. Uh, of, of deaths among those under age 50 uh, happen within an hour after the initial infarct. So if you have uh, an infarct, you got to get that person to the hospital, especially if they're under 50. Uh, if you are that age and you're having an infarction, uh, there's a good chance you're going to die. Um, so these are 2010 values. They certainly are higher now, uh, but 616,000 uh, people, uh, so it's probably close to a million people, die of heart disease uh, in the United States each year. Um, that's approximately 25% of all U.S. deaths. That's a big number. It's a big number. Uh, so <clears throat> it's estimated that uh, it costs the country in 2010 
444 billion dollars. That certainly is over uh, half a trillion dollars now. That's a huge amount of money. That's a huge amount of money. It's a huge amount of money. That uh, was in uh, 2010. Why do I talk about uh, metabolic disease, though? Um, so Maine is not doing too bad. It's that it's that Paula Deen uh, diet. It's that Paula Deen diet that's doing it to people, right there uh, in the South. Uh, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a major problem. Okay, that's all I, I have to say uh, today.